Albany, New York, December 1779. Born to a family of Scottish immigrants, Joseph Henry would grow to become one of the greatest scientific minds in American history. Along with his contributions to science, Henry is known for serving as the first secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Henry considered himself, above all else, a, a pure scientist. He was interested in finding out the truths of nature, the principles of things, and he personally didn't care for the application of those principles except in a sort of playful way and, and, and as they related to education, teaching of the students. Henry began his professional career as a teacher at the Albany Academy and one of his major concerns there was developing apparatus, devices, teaching tools to show the principles of physics to his students. And he knew, he had earlier had some acting experience, so he knew that an impressive demonstration would be much more effective in capturing the interest of his students than just a lecture without any kind of experimental illustration. Henry became interested in electromagnetism during this period when he was teaching at the Albany Academy. And electromagnetism was a, a hot topic at that time. So now when Henry looked at this situation, he realized he could make a stronger magnet by winding the wire more closely but he knew that if the turns touched, they'd short out. So he introduced the innovation of putting insulation on the wire. A very simple idea. And other people had sort of thought of it, but Henry was the first to really do it. And that allowed him then, he made his insulated wire, he was able to wind his, his wire around very tightly. And not only that, he could put extra layers on top. And with those two combined factors, he could make very strong electromagnets, much stronger than any that existed before his time. This is a magnet that Henry built for Yale College in 1831. The core of it weighs 82 and a half pounds and the magnet was able to sustain a load of 2,000 pounds, one ton. Henry developed his electromagnet and realized that one of its applications was that it could be controlled at a distance through a long wire and he came to that realization based on its actual design. So to demonstrate this for his class at Princeton, he set up in his lecture hall uh, an electromagnet with a wire and an arrangement by which he could ring a bell at a distance in the classroom to demonstrate the principle. But this was purely a, a theoretical conception. He had no idea that this could become commercially successful. Henry personally, very much enjoyed searching for scientific truth. He got a thrill, really, out of discovering something new, creating or demonstrating a new effect. Henry's work in electromagnetism played a role in many other innovations, such as Samuel Morse's telegraph and Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Welcome to the electricity collections. This is our storage area. Uh, here at the National Museum of American History. And one of the things we're going to look at uh, this afternoon is uh, Samuel F.B. Morse's prototype telegraph receiver. And this is it. This is from 1837. Uh, again, artist's canvas stretcher with a wooden clockwork mechanism. And what Morse is borrowing from Joseph Henry is the electromagnet design. This electromagnet is basically the kind of thing Henry was working on at that time. A horseshoe magnet wound with insulated wire. And the idea is you pass a current through the wire and it intensifies the magnetic field, makes the magnet much more powerful. At the core of many key inventions was Henry's electromagnet work. Examples of such inventions are preserved at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Near the end of his life, and Henry was uh, still secretary of the Smithsonian, young Alexander Graham Bell came to him for help. Bell had had the idea for the telephone, uh, but he didn't know very much about electricity, so he came to see Secretary Henry for help. They had a meeting in Henry's office, Bell demonstrated what he had, and Henry was quite excited about this. But then Bell 
had a problem. He said to the secretary, Mr. Henry, uh, I really don't know very much about electricity. Uh, how can I get the, uh, how can I, um, how can I learn more? And Henry just said, go out and get it. Get the knowledge you need. And Bell reported later to his parents that this really made the difference. He was inspired then to learn about electricity and was able then to make the telephone a practical invention. Henry was propelled by his passion for discovery, his love of pure science. As secretary of the Smithsonian, it was Henry's dream to democratize science, to make knowledge accessible to the public. So in Henry's day, just as in our day, there's always been a tension between the supporters of pure science and the supporters of applied science. Science of any kind costs money, uh, today as in Henry's day. The difficulty is that the payoff for pure science is not immediate. With applied science, you spend some money to figure something out, and within a few years, you can get something that can be used. With pure science, that may not happen for decades. It may not ever happen. The pay payoff for pure science is more intellectual and aesthetic. The steam engine in Henry's day was an object of great interest, and it's a good example of applied science. The pure science shows the thermodynamics of how it works, that is, the behavior of steam, of gases, uh, you know, as they change their volume, as they change their pressure with changing temperature. The applied science refers to how you can use those principles to actually make an engine run and make, for example, a train run on its tracks. Henry looked at scientific research almost as poetry. By the work of others pursuing his art, Henry's scientific interests have paid dividends not only in the field of communication, but in the study of light as well. My name is Stephen Turner. I'm Curator of Physical Sciences at the National Museum of American History. I've been at the Smithsonian for about 26 years now. I originally was here working in the exhibits department and then later switched over to work in the curatorial affairs. I now take care of the Physical Sciences collection which includes Joseph Henry's prism. For me, the prism has a special meaning because the, the, it illustrates a phenomenon of light called total internal reflection, in which all the light that goes into the prism reflects back out. And that's why when you turn the prism to a certain place, it appears to be a three-dimensional object inside of it. In particular, Henry was interested in light because light was sort of the new frontier in physics at the time. Uh, the wave theory of light had just finally become established in Europe and Henry was anxious to bring this new information to the United States. As the first secretary of the Smithsonian, Joseph Henry saw himself as, as having an, an important role in American science, that he not only wanted to establish the Smithsonian as an institution, but he wanted to promote scientific knowledge within America. He thought that it would lead to progress in America and make America a better democracy. Given Henry's interests, what would he think of today's cutting-edge imaging technologies? Here at the Smithsonian Institution, a team of 3D digitization coordinators known as the Laser Cowboys carry on Henry's dream of democratizing science through their work in laser scanning and 3D printing. So all laser scanners are a little bit different, uh, but in this instance, a laser beam bounces off this 45 degree angled mirror, off of an object, back into the sensor. The mirror actually rotates, and then the whole entire scanner will slowly rotate as well. So you're actually capturing in a spherical direction. So you can scan entire rooms, uh, archaeological digs, exhibit halls, really large things with a scanner like this. So essentially what we're doing when we document an object in 3D is taking millions and millions of measurements. Just like uh, in the past when somebody would take an individual point-to-point -point measurement with a pair of calipers or a tape measure. In order to uh, take it to the next step, we use so computer software um, to essentially connect all the dots. So we have millions of points, we connect all the dots, and we create a, a virtual surface. Um, and that virtual surface can reflect light. We can then calculate volume. If we wanted to 3D print the object, uh, we could do that at this point. So that's really the strength of 3D scanning and 3D objects, is once you've uh, 
sort of invested the time and the resources into creating a 3D uh, digital surrogate of a Smithsonian object or research site, you have many possible deliverables. You can create uh, a 3D print for a scientific inquiry. You could put that object up on the web so people can spin it around and take measurements with it. So if you're not able to come to this, the Smithsonian, you could still get access and experience an object uh, virtually. So one of the most exciting implications of 3D laser scanning is the ability to 3D print replicas. So here we have a one-to-one -one scale replica of Abraham Lincoln's life cast. This is printed in a plaster-like material with very high resolution. And perhaps more exciting than a one-to-one -one replica, which can be quite expensive to create, is the ability to create smaller replicas in lower cost materials. So here we have a replica made in a one-to-four uh, scale. And this is made out of ABS plastic. So this is only a few dollars to print. Um, additionally, the 3D printers are actually very low cost as well, only a, a couple thousand dollars in general. So this means that enthusiasts at home or teachers in the classroom can implement 3D printing technologies quite easily now. So with 3D printing, you start out with a 3D model. That 3D model is sometimes 3D scanned. So we take our scan, we input that into 3D printing software, and it essentially slices it into many, many 2D layers. This isn't too far off from a 2D printer you have at home. Um, in this case, this printer ex extrudes a, a thin layer of plast plastic, um, one layer at a time, um, hundreds or sometimes thousands of times. Uh, so each time it um, extrudes a 2D layer, the bed drops down a very fract a fraction of, a, of an inch, essentially, and prints another layer, and so on and so on, until you have your fully three-dimensional object. Okay, so we've, in the past uh, few years, we've seen the democratization of 3D uh, printing happening in a really big way. And so those two things combined, we think, are going to be really powerful. So the democratization of 3D capture using simple input devices like a cell phone, an iPad, a point-and-shoot camera, combined with a low-cost 3D printer, um, that's two really powerful technologies that are sort of just beginning to come together in a big way. So that's, that has huge implications for museums and for the world, I think. Today, as in Henry's day, knowledge gained through scientific research informs cutting-edge innovation in ways that we can only begin to imagine. It's interesting to think how Henry would have seen what we're doing today because electromagnetism and light all being related, his interest in it is a pure science, but his faith that someday it would evolve into a new technology, a new tool for people to use, is born fruit in in the new imaging that we're seeing, the three-dimensional imaging that we're seeing done at the Smithsonian. So I think he would, he would feel both proud and, and somewhat inspired that his work uh, bore such engaging fruit. As Joseph Henry once said, the seeds of great discoveries are constantly floating around us, but they only take root in minds well prepared to receive them. For young scientists chasing their dreams today, look no further than Henry's message to Alexander Graham Bell if you don't have the knowledge you need, go get it.